Well, hello everyone. This sermon I'm giving right now is the sermon real close to it that I gave to the Feast of, at the Feast of Tabernacles 2022. I've made some adjustments a little bit here and there, but for the most part, it's pretty much what I said. And um, so let's get into it with that. When I was, when our children were young and small, I loved being with them. They loved doing things together with us. And it was really a lot of fun, whether it was packing the car, getting ready to go to the swimming pool or somewhere else, or whether it was helping crack eggs for omelets, or whether it was helping to paint their own room. They just loved being part of it. You know, if I was painting the room because I thought maybe I could do it better than they could, and they would beg me and say, Daddy, can, can we help? And so I okay, you do that part over there. And um, actually, they did a pretty good job, and they seemed to love getting involved. Now, when it came to asking them to help me with my Garden of Eden that I had, that had some weeds in it, well, they suddenly seemed to disappear. <laughs> so my Garden of Eden sometimes became the Garden of Weeden. One time I even um, asked my son, I think he was around 15 or so at the time, uh, why are we getting so many wasps around our back deck, our lanai, our back deck? We didn't call it a lanai back then. We were in Washington then. And I said, why don't you peek under the, under the deck and see if there's something going on there? He looked in and came out with his eyes big and wide. Guess what he saw? This great big, great big uh, wasp nest, about a foot and a half long and about a foot wide. And I'll show you a picture of it if I can. And... Um, but anyway, so we got them involved. We got, and, and really, it wasn't just involving our children. It was getting our children prepared for life so that they would know how to cook an omelet. How, they would know how to make uh, oatmeal or they would know how to paint a room. They would know how to put together a fan, whatever it was that we had just bought. So God, in the same way, is helping us be ready for what he has in mind for us for eternity of course, we repent, we accept Jesus as our Savior, we do all those things, we live by faith, all the things we have to do is uh, faith in God, faith in Christ, looking to Him, but it's also preparing us for what we'll be doing and what we'll call the world tomorrow, the millennium. Now, as a dad and mom, Carol and I knew that we could do things faster and better, uh, less hassle, more perfectly than the kids could, but it's not the same as getting them involved. It certainly wasn't preparing them if we did everything. So God, of course, could do everything more perfectly himself too, but he also wants us involved in getting ready for the kingdom. So uh, let me be super clear here. When I say involving you and preparing you, I am not talking just about the uh, deacons and ministers and song leaders and the leading men and women I'm not talking just about Noah and Abraham and David and the prophets and the apostles. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me, okay? God loves it. I tell you, even though I give these sermons on this website, I often say, I wonder what, what use I'm going to ever be in the kingdom of God. So this was prepared for me too, as, as well as preparing it for you. But he wants us to be ready and prepared for the task and assignments he's going to give us to be servant leaders in different capacities. And everything that's happening to us right now is intended to prepare us. The good, the bad, the ugly, the painful, all of it is preparing us to be effective leaders in the world tomorrow. I'll explain when I say the good and the bad and all of that, the painful, all of that. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles, where I gave this, Sure, it looks back to the time Israel came out of Egypt, dwelt in booths, preparing for the promised land. We also dwell in booths. Peter said in 2 Peter 1, 13 and 14, that while I'm in this tent, this body of mine, I want to remind you of some things. For the Lord has told me that I'll be out of this tent. I'll, I'll lose this tent soon. I'm going to die soon. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 4, also talks about a tent, our lives. But it also pictures a time ahead in the, in the coming millennial reign of Christ when we'll be working with people who have been so traumatized, so horribly traumatized, and we'll have to be able to work with them and help them feel like we understand them. And after they've been through all the natural calamities and the wars and the, everything else that's, and the plagues from God, 
that Revelation and Daniel talk about, it's going to be a really tough time for them. The millennium is not going to be a time of joy and peace and wonder immediately. It's going to take some time to get through all that. They don't even come to keep the feast for a few years, it says in Zechariah 14. All of you who are hearing this who don't keep the feast and all that, learn about them. Learn about them. Because you are being called to understand those things. Now, we've got to be ready for our assignments, okay? So uh, some wonderful things are ahead of us. Uh, I believe, personally, though some of you don't, I believe, personally, there's going to be a wonderful wedding that we're going to be a part of, and it's not going to be on earth. Uh, Revelation 14 talks about the 144,000 on the sea of glass before the throne of God, before the four uh, living creatures, before the 24 elders, and the 144,000 are on that sea of glass before all of what I've just said. That's in heaven, folks. So anyway, that's a different topic. I have sermons about the wedding of the Lamb and all that. You can go look it up. Just type in wedding of the Lamb. So here's the point. You and I can easily see how God involved and prepared Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and uh, Moses, David, the apostles, the prophets. But little old me, little old you, that's the point of the sermon. Yes, God is including little old you and me. Look how he included the very first man that he created, uh, Adam. In Genesis 2, where it takes us back into what happened, um, on the, on the seventh day was, was creation week, was, was creation. And then it goes down and talks about how Adam was created. So that takes us back to the sixth day. In the sixth day, in the beginning of it, God made all the animals. He just called them forth out of the earth. And then they came, they were created. Uh, didn't have to blow anything into their nose, noses. They just were created. And then Adam was created outside the garden. Remember that. You can read that in Genesis 2, around verse 6 or 7. Outside the garden. And then God brought him into the garden. We have to be invited into God's presence always. And he taught him, took him around on a tour of the Garden of Eden. So there's the land of Eden, and then there's a garden in Eden. And then within the center of the garden were the two trees. And this tree, the tree of life, you can eat of it anytime you want. This other tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat of it. Don't eat of it. So God then involved Adam in something else that was really incredible. So we'll put up here Genesis 2, verses 19 to 20, and all the way to 24 later on. Out of the ground God formed every beast, like I've just said, and God brought them to Adam, the ones that were in the garden, to see what he would call them. So this is involving. This is an very, a very important involving. Whatever Adam called the living creature, that was its name. God didn't say, oh, come on, that's a silly name, or that's a complicated name, or we'll never remember that name. So anyway, but Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. And But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. So part of it was to show Adam that, hey, this lion has a lioness, this uh, bull elephant has a, has a female elephant, and so on. This rooster has, has, has a hen, and so on. But Adam couldn't find anything that was comparable to him. Adam was put into a deep sleep, and out of that, God took part of his side. We like to say rib, but it actually means side of the man. And from that side, he built, that's the Hebrew word, he built a woman, body by God, okay? And he brought her to the man. Now Adam's saying, boy, this is more like it, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called Isha, meaning woman. God was so smart. He assigned the naming of the animals, which probably took some hours, before he introduced or created Eve. And I think that was just really cool. God knew what men were. God knew what he designed into men. And uh, God knew that once he presented Eve to Adam, this beautiful, young, naked, young woman, uh, Adam wasn't going to get much more work done. I mean, uh, I'm not trying to be... Somebody thought I, I was at the feast, came up, and, or not came up, but I asked him about something, and he said, well, that part you could have skipped. Well, I said, but God says they were naked. Come on. If God puts it in his scripture. What's wrong with me saying it? So anyway, so let's not be more righteous than God. 
But can you imagine if God had waited till Eve was created and then said, okay, you guys name the animals. He probably would have been saying, hey, Adam, 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 pay attention to the work you have. Quit gawking at Eve. <laughs> at least that's the way. I'm teasing a bit, but come on. Uh, it's in Scripture. Anyway, so your, Adam was created first. That's in Scripture. Eve came later. So you're a piece of the puzzle. God has an overall plan, kind of like this big puzzle my wife found of the 1970s. And look at all the colors and pieces that would be in this puzzle. You are like one piece of that puzzle. Remember that as we go through the sermon. And if you put a puzzle together, but even if one piece is missing, then it's not a complete, perfect puzzle completed, is it? You are that piece of the puzzle, an important piece. It would not be complete without you. So, same thing also with the body of Christ. There's the puzzle, there's also the body of Christ. The church members put together are called the body of Christ all over the Bible. Colossians 1.18 is one, for example, 1 Corinthians, I think it's 12.37 says it. And so... Um, uh, 1227, I think it is, 1 Corinthians 1227, and also Romans 12, verses 4 to 5, talk about we together form the body of Christ. We'll put up here 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 19, out of the New Living Translation. Verse 12, the body has many parts. Many parts make up the one whole body. Verse 13, I'll summarize. So we're all baptized into the one body by one spirit. And verse 14, yeah, the body has different parts, not just one part. Verse 15, so the foot can't say, I don't feel like I'm part of the body because I'm not, after all, a hand. The hand is surely more important. But the hand can't do anything without the feet to take it to, to where it's got to do its things, right? The body needs all its parts, is what Paul is trying to say here. Don't think you're superior or don't think you're inferior. If you're an armpit, it's okay. You are vastly needed. Right? If you're the back of your body, if you're the uh, kneecap or whatever you are, if the whole body, verse 17, were an eye, how would you hear? If the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? Verse 18, but our bodies have many parts, and God has put each one, each part, just where he wants it. How strange a body it would be if we only had one part. No, there are many, yes, he says, there are many parts, but one body. He's trying to say, don't keep thinking of yourself as just isolated or separated or better than or inferior to. Come together. Be one body. I'll talk about coming together more later. The eye can never say to the hand, verse 21, I don't need you. If you've ever thought that way of other members of the body of Christ, repent of it. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. So that's talking about you. What's your name? Put your name in there. You're part of the very body of the Son of God. No matter what part that is, if you're skin, if you're fingernail, it doesn't matter, you're needed. Also, Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16. Um, we'll also put on here, if you want other verses into the body of Christ, we'll post them right now. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Colossians 1, 18, Romans 12, 4 and 5, Ephesians 1, 2, uh, 22 and 23. Now, Ephesians 4. I'm reading out of the Holman translation now. Ephesians 4. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. He's the head, okay? Christ is the head of the body. From him, from him, the whole body fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament promotes growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. Now, God is working on me and on you, so that we are working properly to build his body and be ready to serve in the kingdom of God. God wants us each aware we have a part. We may not be aware just of how God's involving and preparing you, so ask God to show you, and I think the sermon will show you as well in some ways. So uh, let's get some real practical ways now. Leading to point number one, what was the one big mistake that Adam made, and Eve made too, but Adam made, that God does not want us to keep repeating, though we have done the same mistake over and over again? Remember when 
Eve started talking to the serpent. Adam was there. Genesis 3. Eve took of the fruit, ate of it, and gave to her husband who was with her also. In, that's in Genesis 3. Remember, Adam was not deceived by Satan, but Eve was. So Adam is called the first sinner in Romans 5, 12, and 19. Because he knew better. Eve was deceived. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 to 15 says, Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived. But the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Well, they both did. Adam's called the first sinner, actually, not Eve. In Romans 5, 12, and 19. What Adam should have done was look at that serpent and say, I don't know who you are or where you came from. I don't like what you're saying. Get out of here. Eve, come on. We're leaving this guy. Come on, Eve, get out. Leave him. He should have taken charge. Eve should have obeyed his leadership. And he should have then said, God in heaven, whatever he called him, eternal one, Jehovah, Yahweh, whatever he called him, help. I need help. Someone's come in the garden. I wasn't able to keep him out. I need help. But he did not. Point number one in preparing to be a servant leader in the kingdom, in the world tomorrow, in the millennium. The millennium is not just the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is really going to be when we're all spirit for it. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. All these logos we have of the lion and the lamb, which I love so much myself, those are flesh and blood. The kingdom of God is not flesh and blood. It is spirit. Okay, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But it's ruled by the kingdom of God when Christ is here for a thousand years. And then eventually the Father comes down from heaven with the full kingdom and all of that. Anyway, so point number one is call out for help. When you're being tempted, when you're being weak, when you're getting too discouraged, when you're falling into depression, when you're falling into a mood of anger and want revenge, Satan can take hold of all of these. And we'll tell you, whisper in your ear, it's okay. It's okay. No, it's not okay. You need to call out to God. Our Father, I'm being tempted to uh, sexual sin. I'm being tempted for uh, getting drunk. I'm being tempted to go lash out on somebody. Or I have just lashed out on somebody. Help me have the attitude of asking for forgiveness and for being so unkind. Praying a lot. Constant contact. If some of you might be praying on your knees and beside your bed, or if you can get on your knees, some of you are old and in pain, uh, or can't move or whatever, God understands that. Sure, do that. Do that morning, noon, and night, as David said, as Daniel said, three times a day. But all through the day, keep contact going with him all the time. Even if you're incapacitated, the power of prayer is phenomenal. I know a guy named Paul here in Florida. He has MS from the neck down. He cannot move. MS so severe that he can't wiggle his fingers, he can't move his arms, he can't brush his teeth, he can't sit up. He can speak, he can think, and he can pray. And boy does he pray. He's always asking me about how is so-and-so, how is your brother, and so on. And um, he spends his day helping others by prayer. So can you. Now even when we ask for prayers for our own healing with God, Father, I'm in a lot of pain. Can you heal that? Or can you heal my diabetes? Can you heal my high blood pressure, my cancer? Whatever it is that you're fighting. There's something God tells us in James 5.16 that I hope we remember. We'll post it up here. James 5.16, confess your sins, your trespasses to one another, and pray for one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. You want to get healed? Pray for others. When I'm anointing people for healing, in the you know um, before and after the prayer, I'll tell the person. Now, if you want that prayer to be more effective, be sure you're also asking God to heal others. Be praying as fervently for others as you do for yourself. And I really believe that the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, fervent prayer doesn't mean you're loud. Hannah, the mother of Samuel, First Samuel two. Uh, Eli, the high priest, thought she was drunk because 
Uh, what was she doing? She was uh, moving her lips, but he couldn't hear anything. But she had one of the most effective prayers in all the Bible. So it doesn't mean loud. It means your heart's in it. You're vigorously in it. And so anyway, so we are the temple of God. God's very present. He lives in us now by his spirit. Think of the power that that spirit uh, should be giving us as power. With God living in you and me, man, what power we have available. Look what he says in John 14. John 14, 23. Jesus answered, said to him, If anyone loves me, he will come. He will keep my word. My Father will love him. And we, my Father and I, God Almighty, God in the highest, and I, will come live in you. What's your name? If you've been baptized, had hands laid on you to receive the Holy Spirit, God the Father himself and Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, come live in you. It's by their spirit, but they're inside of you. The spirit is the revelation of God. It's the, it's the essence of God. And we will come to him and make our home with him. So now God is inside of us. Remember, even the pagans, they would put Zeus in their temple and call it a, a temple, a house of prayer or whatever. We are the house of prayer. God is in us. Isaiah, what is it? Isaiah 56, I think it is, verses 6 and 7. Uh, Jesus even quoted this. Uh, my, God, God's house is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, and you made it a den of thieves. Isaiah 56. So we're now a house of prayer. If people were behind the scenes, unknown to you, observing you, would they remark at the end of each day that he is, she is, a house of prayer of God? Because we're constantly speaking to him throughout the day. I'm trying to get in the habit of doing that throughout the day on every little thing that comes up. As well as prayer before bedtime, prayer when I get up, that's more intensive, more focused, takes you know a few more minutes than just the constant contact prayers. But would you be called a house of prayer? So make sure you're praying for others as well as you do this, as I talked about Paul. And God really, really likes it when we call him. Um, when my grandchildren call me, I, I just love it. It doesn't happen nearly as often as I want. But it does happen from time to time. I just love it. So when we call out to God in prayer, he loves it. I promise you, he loves it. He loves it. How I love hearing from my kids, hearing their voice, letting them hear mine. So every day, Jesus said, Yeshua said, seek first the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be added unto you that you're worried about. Seek first. Putting God first doesn't just automatically happen. We have to, he doesn't slide into first base. We have to make sure we put him there first in our lives. So point number one, let's not make the same mistake Adam made by not calling out to God for help. Let's call out to God for help. A lot, a lot of prayer, a lot of prayer, and a lot of calling out to him. Point number two. Point number two, it's not so much what you're doing, but what your heart and attitude tell God about the way we feel, about the little things he's given us to do. Don't despise the little things to do. They're preparing you. They're preparing you. Okay, you may not be building an ark like Noah did. You may not be slaying a giant like David did. You may not be baptizing people. But God is looking at your heart as you do the little things he's asked you to do. For example, while I was at the feast, I noticed sometimes a couple of women at the door would help people as they were coming in the last few minutes. Please don't come in the last few minutes. We should come before God ready to, ready for him to start on time, have our briefcases or whatever we have, our bags open, the Bibles out, note paper out, kids to the bathroom, everything ready, ready to start. So when God ready, is ready to start, it happens. I, 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 I'm telling you, the morning and evening sacrifices, they were done at exactly the right moment. They're supposed to have been. But anyway, I found these ladies saying, do you, have, you want us to help you find a seat? Oh, yes, please. They would see that it was full. And they would say, here, there's two over here, there's four over there. And they would help them find a seat. I'm telling you, that's preparing them for the kingdom of God. 
God looked upon their heart that they were willing to see a problem and jump in, not having to be asked, jumped in and just help out. And or maybe maybe you feel that uh, the singers on stage could use one or two more voices and and someone mentions how beautifully you sing and you ask, can I join the, the singing of you're not building an ark, but you're helping out. Luke 16, verse 10. He who's faithful in what's least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. And there's also a verse in Zechariah, I think it's 4, verse 10. It's not in my notes. It should be, though. Zechariah 4, verse 10, that don't despise a day of small things. Don't say, I've only been asked to be an usher. Or I haven't been asked to do anything, but I'm going to volunteer for some things. I'm going to help out where I can. Um, I see this old person, obviously in pain, has dropped something on the floor. Let me jump in and say, can I help you? I'll, I'll get it for you. God's looking at your heart. That's the kind of person God wants for his kingdom. Whether you're just singing the choir or you're, someone's asked you to sing your first solo. You've never sung in front of a group before. But you sing so beautifully. Stretch. Ask God to give you the faith. And sing out. Step out in faith. Might feel like stepping out of the boat and walking on water. Do it. We've all been called to do our own walking on water. The difficult things and times in our lives. Helping people find seats. Taking two minutes to talk to teens and children. Making them feel like they're part of the group by doing so. We had a lady who got boxes of items that was, were being sent out to people uh, she knew weren't able to attend the feast. And people dropped in other things in there as well. One man there, Robert, uh, Robert Bates, practically organized the whole feast himself. The videos and the, the songs and the song leading and booking the place. Uh, without him, it would have been a very different feast. I hope he understands. That was not even a small thing, but... He was very faithful in doing it. The setup crew, the information table, the ushers, if they're security, security guards. I don't know why we need security guards at the feast. I remember when I was uh, in one big area in the south one time, and they had all these men outside the door. They weren't able to hear the sermon. I asked them what they were doing. They said, well, we're security. I said, how many times have you actually had to be here for security? And none of them said ever. But anyway, it wasn't my deal. Uh, it, whatever you're called to do, uh, speakers, seminars, we speakers spend, I do, I know others do, spend hours and hours on, on sermons at the feast before we give them. Hours and hours, doing, redoing, moving things around, and so on. So point number two, uh, don't despise the little things and do them faithfully. Do them with all your being. Number three, number three, do things without giving yourself any credit or uh, just jump in when you see a need. Number three, it's a little different from number two. Jesus said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. That's in Matthew 6, verse 3. Don't think about it. Don't tell others about it. That's so hard for sometimes for us to keep from telling others about the good things we're doing. In fact, when you go to Matthew 25, Let's write this down, Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. If you're not real familiar with this section, go back and read it later on. When Christ comes, he says, the nations are gathered before him, and his sheep are on the right, the goats are on the left. And the sheep, he says, are people who, when you saw me naked, you clothed me. When you saw me hungry, you fed me, and all of that. Let's put it up, Matthew 25, 34 to 36. Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. I was hungry. You gave me food. I was thirsty. You did something about it. I was a stranger. You took care of that problem. You took me in. I was naked. You clothed me. I was sick. You visited me. I was in prison. You came to see me. And they have no idea what he's talking about. They're not thinking about all the things they've been doing, apparently. And they said, when do we see you like that? Never do anything for you, verses 37, 38. 39, the king will say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, my brethren, you did it to me. So they were helping feed and clothe and visit people who were down, who were believers, who were others, uh, the least of these. People maybe in other countries who are so poor. 
compared to us in America and Canada and in Europe and so on. So poor. And you're willing to send a few bucks to help them have food to eat. This lie that's out there that everything is so cheap in Kenya or some other place that you can buy a whole week's supply of food for just pennies. That's, that's a lie. It's not true. Or that you can go to the hospital with COVID for just pennies. That's not true. Cost money. When we went to Guyana for the feast in 1984, we actually found that the, the black market on the street selling just calculators that we paid $3 for in America at the time, they were like $35 and $40. I kid you not. And so people outside America who are believers especially do need your help. Help me help them. We do help some people in Kenya with Light on the Rock. Please help me help them. And just go to lightontherock.org and, and uh, you can see how to contact us and everything else. Now in the same way, when we hurt someone in the body of Christ, we probably all have done that one way or another. Christ says, you're doing it to me. Remember when he called Paul, who was first called Saul, his Hebrew name was Saul, his Greek name was Paul. Paul says in Acts 26, recounting it to, to Festus or the governor or Agrippa, or whoever it was, he, he says that he heard everything spoken in Hebrew, in Acts 26, verses 12 to 15. And he asked, Who are you, Lord? And speaking in Hebrew, the Son of God said, Acts 26, verses 12 to 15. I think this is verse 13 or 14. The Son of God said, the Son of God said, and he was speaking in Hebrew. He would not have said Jesus, by the way. That sound wasn't even known yet at that point. There's no J in Hebrew anyway. Neither did he speak in Greek. Yesus, he spoke in Hebrew. So he would have said, I am Yeshua. That's what the Son of God said his name is. Please don't fight me, you guys, who are fighting me on saying Yeshua. Right here, the Son of God, in Hebrew, would have said, I know your English Bible says, I am Jesus. But the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew that he would have used was, I am Yeshua, whom you are persecuting. Why are you hurting me? Why are you doing this to me? So Paul was hurting people, and some of them died. Why? Okay? So don't hurt people, but bring, do your best to help people and don't even think about it. Like the beautiful sheep of Matthew 25 who didn't even know they'd done all these things. So point one, remember Adam's mistake. Don't repeat it. Call out to God a lot. Number two, uh, testing and preparing us in little things to see if we're faithful in little. He who's faithful in little will be faithful in much. So let's be faithful in whatever we've been asked to do. If you're a husband, if you're a father, if you're Whatever, be faithful in that position. Be kind to your wife. Be kind to your children. And a lot of us guys have to learn that. Number three, jump in when you see a problem without having to be asked, without making a big deal. Just jump in. Help out. Don't think about it. Point number four, speak up to God in loving concern for your nation. Speak a lot to him. Again, it shows your heart. Don't be a Jonah who will preach a warning message, but no message of repentance and salvation and joy and hope. Don't be like that. God sometimes looks for a man who's willing to stand up to him. Show that you have a lot of concern for the nation. And uh, in Ezekiel 22, verses 30, 31, complete Jewish Bible has it this way, I sought for a man among them who could build a barricade and stand in the break to oppose me on behalf, on behalf of the country, on behalf of the land, so that I would not destroy it. But I couldn't find anybody. I found no one. Therefore, I'm going to pour out my fury. So sometimes God says I'm going to do something like he did in Nineveh. But in this case, Jonah didn't even particularly stand in the breach. He just preached the message of, you're going to all be destroyed. Some of you love that message. God says, I want someone to stand in the breach to tell me why I shouldn't do this. But who am I? Who are you? 
Notice God does not say, I look for a minister. I look for an elder. I look for a king. I look for a prophet. I look for a priest. I look for a leader. No. He just says, I look for someone. In this sermon, I'm saying, we, the believers and children of God, let's be the someone who prays for our nation, prays for this world that God be merciful, even though the world deserves everything he could pour out on it. God did see Abraham, if you ever thought of it this way, praying for Sodom. I think that's in Genesis 18. You and I would say, no, he was praying for Lot and his family. There'd be 50, 40, 30, 20, or 10 righteous. I'm sure he was. But Lot is never mentioned. He just says, would you spare the whole city? if there be 10 righteous in it. This was the same group of people that Abraham risked his life to save. They had been taken captive in Genesis 14. Many of you, many of us might feel normally, no, they, they deserved whatever they had coming. They were very sinful. Uh, in Ezekiel, it lists a whole bunch of sins that they had, not just the one we think of normally. But Abraham prayed for them. A lot of you don't like me saying it that way, I'm sure. Abraham, I'll say it again, prayed for them. After the rebellion of Korah, well, first of all, you know that Mo Moses in Exodus prayed for the nation that God wouldn't wipe out the whole nation and start over with him. He prayed for Aaron, he prayed for the whole nation. In number 16, you have the story of Korah's rebellion. Go back and read the first half of the chapter. And they all fell in a giant sinkhole, all these rebels. The next day, thousands came out against Moses and Aaron, intent on killing them. God, in his anger, commanded, go back and read it, number 16, verses 41 to 45, commanded Moses and Aaron to get away from them so he could wipe them out. So they came together in verse 41, verse 42, um, the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron. And God's glory covered the tabernacle. They, if they had half a brain cell working part-time, they should have known to get away from there. And then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting. And the Eternal spoke to Moses saying, Get away from this congregation. That was his command. Get away from them. That I may consume them in a moment. But you know what? They didn't. They fell on their faces. I want you to think about what I'm reading here. They did not obey this command from God. They did not get away. Some of you are almost happy to hear of all these things happening to the nation or about to happen as if it's about time. Pray for the nation is my plea to you. Verse 46, jumping ahead. What happened? Moses told Aaron, Take a censer, put fire in it from the altar, put incense on it, like they symbolize prayers. Take it quickly into the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from Jehovah, the plague has begun. Are you following me, what that's all saying? Aaron, no, we're not going to leave these people. These are our sheep. These are God's sheep. Let's pray for them. Let's go right in the middle of them, praying for them. Verse 47, Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded, ran into the midst of the assembly, for already the plague had begun among the people. He put the incense and made atonement for the people. He ran into them, not away from them. And he stood in the gap. He stood in the breach. Like God said in the book of Ezekiel, he stood between the dead and the living, so the plague was stopped. God did not kill Moses and Aaron. I think God was very pleased that they loved their enemies, that they prayed for those who would spitefully use them and persecute them and even kill them. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides all the thousands who died in the Korah incident. 
Are you hearing me, brethren? Moses and Aaron put their own lives on the line. Look how powerful it is to pray for our enemies. Look how powerful it is to pray for the nation. 2 Chronicles 7.14 is quoted by everybody. If my people who call by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and all that and turn from their wicked ways and I will hear from heaven and I will hear, heal their land. Let's read it again. I pray the nation repents, sure. But this says, if my people called by my name, Christ, Tian, Christian, Church of God, if my people called by my name will humble themselves, start with you and pray and seek my face. Try to seek God with all your heart. Turn from there wicked ways. If my people would turn from their own wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. You and I, let's do that. God wants his children involved, starting with us repenting for our own shortcomings of the glory of God. So you have a place in God's plan. And when God starts pouring out the plagues, pandemics, fire, drought, and floods, which will be coming. We need to be people who are praying for the country, for the cities involved, and doing our part. If you can't literally be there, send money to the groups that are feeding them, clothing them, preparing them, helping them. Make sure you are. Make sure you're involved. If you're anywhere within driving distance that you can go and help Help people find missing persons. Help scoop up mud to help people get their lives back together. Let's let the church of God, the brethren who have God's spirit, be foremost in these things. Sometimes we're placed in significant places in society like Esther was. She was the wife of the emperor who didn't know she was a Jew. And Mordecai, her cousin, says... If you remain silent, Isaiah, uh, Esther, Esther 4, verses 13 to 14. If you remain silent at this time, relief will arise somewhere else, he says. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you've come into the kingdom, the kingdom of Persia at the time, for such a time as this. Who knows if you are where you are for such a time as this. So point number four, pray for the nation, put your heart in it, get involved. Okay. I hope the sermon today opens your heart to wake up to that. Let God show you ways you can be involved. God wants us all involved now because we'll be involved with people who, frankly, when we first go to our assigned cities, may not welcome us at first. They see us as part of an invasion from outer space with Christ. And we're going to have to win them over. And you're going to have to love them. Number five, be working to bring people together. Do something. It's going to be so important as we get started in the millennium to bring people together. Luke eleven twenty three. Words of Yeshua. He who is not with me is against me. He who doesn't gather with me scatters. If you're not gathering people together and doing nothing, you're helping the scattering to go on. Bring believers together. I chaired a committee that brought together the graduates from the private college I went to in the, for our class it was hard at first because they'd all left the religious group they were once a part of. But I just had this really strong push by God, bring them together. It's not a church service, just bring them together, get them talking to each other again. And they did. It was wonderful. Bring believers together. Visit other groups that are not part of your group. 
how do you know if they're part of the true church of God? If, if they have God's spirit, they are part of that church group. It's that simple. They're part of the body of Christ if they have God's Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9. You're none of his if you don't have the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, verse 14. All those who are led by God's Spirit are his children. They're not all in your corporate body, folks. I promise you that. They're not. There are many, many different groups. And not everybody in your group has God's Spirit. And not everybody in any group has God's Spirit. God knows who his church is. The church is whoever has his Spirit scattered all over the place. You and I have to start bringing those people together. You and I have to be willing to visit with them, even if they're not part of the corporate group you're normally a part of. So that's what I love about the pastor who was a pastor of our group in, in, uh, Lake, in, in the Lake Tahoe area, Pastor David Antion. He welcomes anyone who wants to come worship there, anyone. He doesn't forbid anyone attending somewhere else who normally attends somewhere else. Brothers and sisters, we've got to come together as believers. I remember going to a wedding one time where the bride was from one church group, corporate group, another one. They, these were Sabbath keepers. These were holy day keepers. But they were in different corporate groups who didn't mingle together normally. But the bride and the groom came from two separate groups, and now they were getting married. And I was there, and this older lady uh, came to me and said, what group, what church are you a part of? And I said, the Church of God. She says, yeah, 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 we're all Church of God, but which one? And I said, there's only one. So what do you mean, which one? There's only one Church of God. And then she says, oh, you're so frustrating. She then said, well, who, who's your leader in your corporate body? In other words, I'm a Paul, I'm a Peter, I'm a Paulus. Remember 1 Corinthians 1? Who's your leader? And I said, my leader? Jesus Christ. Then she got real frustrated with that, and she wanted me to say that I am part of a corporate body. I am not a part of a corporate body. I'm a part of the body of Christ. I attend with different ones, or I visit different ones. I have attended different ones. My affiliation is the body of Christ. I hope we get that. Do your best to bring the body of Christ together. Open your eyes. When you're at the feast or something and you see someone coming in you don't recognize, go to them, welcome them, ask them where they're from, tell them who you are. That will be a hallmark in the millennium, noticing, doing something, welcoming people into the family of God and his rulership. You're preparing for the kingdom. You're preparing for your assignments by doing simple things like that. Become one who is inviting others to join in a luncheon or something like that. You don't have people ever inviting you out? I had one per two people. We had two people invite us out this last feast. And I was so glad for that. Uh, most of the time we have to be the one calling people, hey, let's get together or whatever. I think they think that all the ministers are probably all just book solid. That's not true. Simply not true. So anyway, we corporate bodies and way beyond Church of God, the, the Hebrew Roots people, the Messianics, uh, uh, Church of God Seventh Day, and others who uh, may, under, may not understand everything the way you do, or they would say the thing about, same thing about you. God can put knowledge in there very quickly, but the heart is hard to put in quickly. God can put knowledge. And so do your best to bring these people together. I just have a hard time seeing how God is going to let Christ marry a bride, the body of Christ, made up mostly of people who won't worship together, won't talk to each other, and many of them don't even like each other. It'd be like having the body of Christ where a leg is over here and an arm is in this other corporate group, and the feet are over somewhere else, the nose is somewhere else, the liver is somewhere else. It's not a body, folks. That's a mess. Do your best to bring the people together. Be part of that. Talk to all believers in Christ. If they believe in Christ, talk to them. Let your differences in doctrine be something Christ fixes. So number five. Be, be a gatherer. If 
you're not gathering with me, you're scattering. Point number six, disciple others. Spread God's word, even though you're not a minister. So point one, don't make Adam's mistake, call out to God. Point two, uh, be faithful in the little things God's given you to do. Point three, jump in when you see anything that needs to be done and don't think about it. Just do it. Point number four, pray for the nation. Get involved. Stand in the breach. These are ways he's preparing you. Point number five, be a gatherer, bringing people together. You're going to have to gather people together into the kingdom of God from all different parts of the world. Point number six, disciple others. Many of us think the command Jesus gave in the end of Matthew 28 to go into all nations and teaching them all the things I've commanded you, baptizing them and so on, make disciples out of them, that that was given to the 12 apostles, 11 apostles at that time. Well, let's see what happened in practice. Because for too long, too many of you have felt that your job is just to pray and pay. Pray for the church, pray for the work they're doing, and pay your tithes. I have sermons on tithing right now. It's different than the new, new covenant. We still do, if you want to call it tithing, but now it's not limited to 10%. It's not limited to Israel. It's not limited to the produce of the land and the herds and flocks. But we are supposed to be supporting those who are feeding us. It's all in there. I hope you listen to it. Tithing in the new covenant. So I still do that. I still do a lot of that. And I hope you do too. But we always use John 6, that no one can come to Christ unless the Father called him and opened his mind and set the way and all that. So therefore, how's, how do I know that God's even calling them? Might be, be just wasting my time. So therefore, I remain silent and God will call him. God will bring him into his body, his way. And I don't need to do anything. False. False. Now listen carefully. In Acts 7, a deacon called Stephen is martyred, the first martyr of the New Covenant. This was followed by a great persecution against the believers. It was dangerous to use the name Yeshua or Jesus. It was dangerous to speak of him and his resurrection, that he is the Messiah, the Christ. Christ and Messiah both mean anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. It's the same thing, okay? You could be thrown in jail or even killed for that. And the persecution got so bad that most of the believers fled, fled Jerusalem. How bad would it have to be for you to leave home? It was pretty bad. The time is coming again where it will be that bad. Now remember, Stephen had already been killed. Let's pick up now the next verse after Stephen is killed at the end of Acts 7. Acts 8 now, verse 1 and 3 to 5. Now Saul, was, that became Paul, was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church. Acts 8, I'm reading. Which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judah and Samaria, except the apostles. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered, now go back to the end of, is it the end of verse 1 or 2 where it says they were all scattered except the apostles. So the preachers, the apostles, stayed in Jerusalem. Verse 4, therefore, those who were scattered, these are not the apostles, these are the brethren, went everywhere preaching the word. Some of you have a hard time with this. It's right there. Stretch. Step out of your boat. Walk on water a little bit if this is difficult for you. They went everywhere preaching the word. But what does it say they were doing? They were preaching the word. You might think you could never do that. Well, they did. Acts 11. Now those who were scattered... Acts 11, verse 19 to 21. Those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen. Okay, we just read it. They went everywhere preaching the word. Traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch. That's a long ways. Preaching the word. Okay, to no one but Jews only. Some of them were men from Cyrus, Cyprus and Cyrene. 
who when they had come to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, speaking the Lord, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. God loved it. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. But what were we told to do years ago? Leave the proclaiming of the gospel to the professionals, to the ministers, to the TV televangelists, to pastors. You, you, it was implied that you might mess things up. So we prayed and paid. But you know what? I was sent to an area one time back in Canada that hadn't grown for seven years. One of the first things I did is prune the tree a little bit, people who were dead wood. And then within three years it had doubled, the next three years it doubled again. I remember telling people about Acts 8, go everywhere, preach in the world, talk, talk to people about it, share it with people. And I remember a lady who called me up and said, whatever you've done for my sister, please do for me too. She used to be such a B word, such a terrible person. Whatever you did for her, I want you to do for me. And I just said, all I did is lead her to Christ. You're welcome to come. You're welcome to listen and come and ask questions, and I'll be glad to help. And then she said, um, I want to know what Christ is like. And I said, if you want to know what Christ is like, follow that member over there and his wife. They're very deeply converted. You'll learn a lot about Christ by watching them. She was baptized and then her, brought her other sister in. I had a Mountie, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who was coming alone. I talked to him and said, I thought you said one time you were married, had kids. He says, yeah, but they don't seem to want to come. I said, have you invited them? He said, I can. I said, sure. And so the next Sabbath, early in the day, he said, would you like to come with me? She said, of course. I just was wondering when you'd ask me. So she came, and she in turn brought other people with her as well, children and so on. So anyway, um, one time I was flying back from New Orleans back to Portland, Oregon, and undesigned by us, I went to my seat, and next to me was the man I submitted my business to, a guy named Mike. And he says, great, this is wonderful. And I'm thinking, wow, this is not coincidence. What are the odds of this happening? It wasn't Southwest. It was another airline where you had to book an exact seat. And uh, he said, I want to know why you don't come to our Saturday business meetings. I knew he was, ex he was a Nazarene. And so I said, uh, do you have a Bible with you? I like using people's Bibles more than my own. Then they know it's the, for real. It's their Bible. So he pulled out his Bible, and it was a long flight, many hours. And as we got towards the end of it, he said, wow. He says, why haven't I seen this before? I was showing him about the Sabbath. And I said, you see it now? He said, yes. So here's where it confirmed to me, John 6, God was calling him, opening his mind. So it was wonderful. Mike has since then, and his wife, helped bring in scores of people, neighbors, and others to a Messiah believing in Sabbath keeping fold. So, yeah, get out there and disciple. I'll give a whole sermon on it soon. It's very important. Point number seven, the last one. Believe that all things God's permitting in your life is going to work out for good. They're all going to work out for good. That's what Romans 8.28 says, right? And will help prepare you for the great royal priest to be a great royal priest in the kingdom. And I'm including all the painful and hurtful things that have happened to you as well. All things work together for good. Remember what Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good, because by me being in Egypt, God has let me now to this place where I can save so many people alive, including my own family. So all those years in jail, all those years, father, dad, J Jacob was worried about what on earth happened to me. <coughs> worked out. It's okay. Romans 8, 28, we, we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called, according to his purpose. God is so great. I hope you believe this. He's the giant in our lives. He, he creates the world. And 
in the Bible, we were just dust, but he's going to make something of you and me. So we thank God that all things work together for good. So Ephesians 4, verse 6 and 7 says, In all things, give thanks. Okay, let your requests be made known with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known with thanksgiving. And then you are surrounded and enveloped in this wonderful peace beyond description, it says in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. For all things, give thanks. Ephesians 5, 20, I believe it is. So why does God allow us to go through such painful things? Such hard times? Why doesn't he heal us right away sometimes, many times? So that you will understand people in the world tomorrow who have gone through a lot of pain. And they will understand that you know what pain's like. You know what it's like to lose a child, as we have. Plus two miscarriages beyond that. We know what it's like to lose a sister, as I have. To lose our parents, as both my wife and I have. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. Bless be the God and the Father. God is also the God of Jesus Christ. Bless be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort we receive from God. Why are you in pain? Why are you going through hard things? So that you can tell people, you know what? I had something not like, quite like yours, but it was painful. God got me through it. And God will help you get through this. Sometimes by healing and sometimes just by giving you help through it. Remember that verse, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. Let's stick it up again. I want you to really let that be sunk in. You may agonize over sins or weaknesses, temptations you struggle with. Wonder why you're finding it so hard to overcome that? Same thing. You can explain. If you're an alcoholic, you can explain to alcoholics. I know it's tough. I'm an alcoholic, but I've, I've been sober now. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I am, but I'm saying you're, I'm quoting you. That you're saying, I'm an alcoholic and, I'm, you know, God will help you with it. Or maybe you're really heavy and have a hard time losing weight. I can sure identify with that. Or maybe you have sexual weaknesses and sins. God will use even those things to help you identify with people and help them. God is completing the perfection he wants in you. Okay? The reason God allows us to have this painful suffering is so we can identify and empathize, but also by the suffering we are being perfected. Even Jesus had to go through suffering to be completed as a high priest who understands us. Hebrews 2, verse 10. It was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things. Hebrews 2, verse 10. In bringing many children or many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect, complete. It can mean both. Through sufferings. Through sufferings. 1 Peter 5, 10. This applies to us now too. May the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while. After you have suffered a while. Perfect means to complete and perfect, establish, strengthen and settle you. So going through pain and suffering is all part of God's plan in completing us. It's part of God's plan. And that's why even in the pain, we ought to be able to, in the pain, present the request to God with thanksgiving, even in and for the pain. And everything we're learning from it, should be learning from it. Your painful times are times God is preparing you for the time to come for the world tomorrow. If you've lost a child, if you've lost a wife, a husband. No one knows how painful all that is until they've been through it. If you're going through painful health issues, I've been hospitalized for a heart attack. I have many other health issues. 
You may not see it or know it with me standing here. Pray for me. I'll pray for you. So God wants your involvement in helping people in the world to come. Nothing's wasted. Do you know you can even commit your sins to God for his good use? You're saying, Philip, now you're going too far. Sins are bad. Sins have no good use. David and Bathsheba. I'm sure David's going to be very embarrassed to see it's part of Scripture. What came of that? Bathsheba, Bathsheba, means daughter of the covenant. But what came of that union? Yes, yeah, Solomon was born. They lost their first, you know, the child from the fornic uh, from the adultery. But if you go back to, I think it's Matthew one. You can see that the lineage for the Messiah himself, for the Son of God, to be born as a man, as a boy, came through the lineage of David and Bathsheba. I think that's just amazing. I think that's just inspiring. That no matter how bad you've been and I've been, if we've repented of it, turned from it, and give it to God, he can turn even those things somehow to his glory. So don't think that you've been disqualified forever and ever for something because of some stupid things you've done in the past. You know, if you go to Hebrews 11 and read about all the men and women of faith, you know what you don't find there? You don't find a list of their failures. You don't find a list, you don't find any mention of Abraham lying twice about his wife as being his sister. He, she was his half-sister, I know that. But the intention was to lie. You don't, lie. you don't find anything about Sarah laughing. You don't find anything about David and Bathsheba. You don't find anything about the many sins of Samson. All you find is good stuff about those people there. When it's all said and done, Revelation 14, the first four verses, it says the 144,000 stand on the sea of glass before I think it's verse 2 or 3, before the throne of God, before the living creatures, before the 24 elders. And they have a song that no one else can learn. Some of you would love to sing. All of you who sing would love to sing better. I really believe the 144,000 is going to be making up the choir of God that is going to be so beautiful, and I hope and pray that you and I will be part of it. The mute will be able to speak. The lame will be able to jump. And we're there on the sea of glass in heaven. Where else are you going to find before the throne, before the four living creatures, before the 24 elders? Some of you insist so much that it can't be in heaven when it says so right there. But anyway, I really believe my father, your father, will look at us and say, children, children, would you sing for me? And then this incredible, beautiful song, pitch perfect, on key, perfectly harmonious. Hopefully you and I will be part of that. Singing to God. This beautiful song. Revelation 17, later in chapter 17, verse 14, it talks about all the nations assembled against Christ to make war with him. Look at the end of verse 14. And those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. God has to call you. To be chosen, you have to accept that call. That takes you up a notch. And now we have to endure to the end. Now we have to be faithful no matter what. Those who are called, chosen, and faithful are the ones who will be with him. And we're going to go from glory to glory, it says in 2 Corinthians 3, the end of it. And we shall bear the image of the Son of God. Son of Man, of the Heavenly Man. 1 Corinthians 15, let's put that up. Verses 48 to 49. God loves getting you involved. God is getting you involved. God is preparing you in ways you don't even see. But thank God for it because you shall bear the image. Verse 49. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. And we have been, and we, as we have borne the image of the man of dust. Yeah, right now I look like Adam. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. 
Imagine what could be happening if God's people called by his name, if we would all be praying for him to work with us fully, for us to see him working with us, for us to respond correctly, for us to thank him for everything happening to us, let all things be to his glory. Yes, you're being prepared to be effective servants of God, children of the highest, for all eternity. Come, dear Jesus. Father in heaven, we raise our hands in praise to you and we bow our heads in worship. Father, help us understand you're working with us, not just with the greats of the Bible, but at each one of us, we're a piece of the puzzle that the puzzle wouldn't be complete without us. And you have made it so. Father in heaven, I pray that you will just open the minds of all those who are hearing this, have heard it. They will praise you for how you're preparing them. Help us to do our part and be there faithful to the very end. Give us strength to be there. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Yeshua, the Messiah, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.